<laughs> Thank you, Cherie. Well, you'll remember when we uh, started our little journey through the book of Esther, uh, we noted that in the entire book, uh, God's name is not mentioned. He is nowhere uh, to be found in print in the book of Esther. And uh, as we discussed, uh, some, some folks uh, think that that's a, a bad thing. They have a book in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of God. But I think in Esther, that's the very essence and point of the book is that God is present. He is working behind the scenes in our lives, moving things around to accomplish His exact purpose. Whether we are aware of His presence or not, He is still there and He is working. Now, uh, in, in chapter 1, uh, we set the stage a little bit. We learned a little bit about Ahasuerus, whose Greek name is Xerxes, and as I've mentioned, that's the Xerxes that shows up in the 300 Spartans movie. And same guy, just a different form of his name. Kind of gives you a little uh, idea of who he is. Uh, last week in chapter 2, uh, we were introduced to Mordecai and Esther. And uh, we learned a little bit about how their lives were going, and, and they were sort of uh, going along to get along, if you remember. And in fact, uh, if we were descri to describe their model for living in the empire, that would be just what it is. Uh, they were going along to get along. Uh, they weren't necessarily denying uh, their Jewishness or denying their God, but they weren't telling anybody about it either. They were just sort of keeping their mouths shut and getting along as best as they could. Uh, in in uh, verse 10 of chapter 2, uh, we see this. Uh, Esther had not made known her people or her kindred. So she didn't say anything about that. In verse 19, now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the gate. And we noted that the fact that he was sitting at the gate uh, probably makes him some kind of a mid-level bureaucrat in the government. And if he had risen to that point in the Persian government, he certainly had not been pushing the fact that he was a Jew or that he served the great living God. Well, Today, uh, in chapter 3, we're going to see that events will unfold in such a way as to force Mordecai to take a stand. Now, in chapter 3, uh, Esther is not uh, mentioned. She's not here. Uh, she's over in the palace getting herself ready. Uh, and so we're going to just look at uh, uh, the three guys uh, today. In fact, we could actually call this a tale of three men if you would, because we're going to get a closer look into who Ahasuerus, Haman, and Mordecai really are and kind of what motivates them. You remember that chapter 2 closed with Mordecai foiling a plot to kill the king. You remember he heard these guys talking, plotting about that, and he, he went to Esther, Esther related it to the king, and, and let him know that it was Mordecai who did this. And then we noted that there was a very strange thing that happened in that it was the custom of uh, these kings uh, to greatly reward anyone who uh, was loyal to them in, in that kind of a sense so that other people would see, oh, it pays off to be loyal to the king. But somehow, Ahasuerus completely overlooked it. And he's not even mentioned. And instead of recognizing Mordecai for what he had done, we're introduced to this new guy on the scene that we, up until now we don't really know anything about, by the name of Haman. And we're told that the, the king elevates Haman. How do you suppose that made Mordecai feel? You know, have you ever been passed over for a promotion or something that you thought you deserved? You know, maybe you worked really hard. Maybe you're the, the hardest worker in your office or on your job site. And you do everything right. And your sales are great or your performance is great or whatever. And there's a, 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 a slot open and you, you just know you're going to get it because you've worked so hard and you're the, the logical choice. And then they would go over here maybe in some other department and bring in somebody that doesn't do half as much as you do. Doesn't make you feel very good, does it? If you haven't experienced it, you can at least imagine it. 
Uh, it, it really would take the wind out of your sails. Well, I'm quite sure that's what it did to Mordecai. He saved the king's life. If anybody uh, should be elevated to a position of importance, it would be Mordecai, not this Johnny-come-lately Haman. Well, what if we could break into the story here, as we do from time to time, and talk to Mordecai? And say, Mordecai, how do you feel right now? And maybe we could speak to his life and we say, you know, Mordecai, all things work together for good. You know, and we could say, Mordecai, it, it's going to be all right. Well, that's true, but it's often rather vacuous to the person that's going through these things. If we were to say to Mordecai, Mordecai, God is working mightily in your life. God is even going to use you to be the instrument to save the entire Jewish people. Mordecai would probably call for the little men in white coats to take us away. <laughs> but we know that's exactly what's happening, don't we? Well, let's look and see what we can learn here about uh, these uh, three protagonists today. And we'll start with uh, Ahasuerus. Now, we know that he was the most powerful man on earth at the time. In fact, remember back in chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us, Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. That's huge. Huge kingdom. He had way over a million man army. And most of you have seen this, the movie, either the one that came out, gee, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago, or the one that came out here four or five years ago, the 300 Spartans. And that's exactly what happened in that movie. And this guy is the one who, who was in charge. Now, we, we, we need to, to really get a grasp of his personality. Uh, we saw that he was prone to fits of anger and making foolish decisions. You remember with Vashti, and he, he booted her out. But uh, his, his anger is even more of a problem than that, his temper. Now, I know none of you can identify with that. But I would just like you, now, don't raise your hands, I don't want you to identify yourself. But just ask yourself a question. Was there ever a time in your life when your temper caused you a problem. And I don't necessarily mean ongoing, like you, you, know, you had to be restrained, but that you're, you, you got so angry, you, you said something you wished you hadn't have said, or you did something you wish you hadn't have done. It's never good when we do things out of anger. The result is just never good. But uh, Ahasuerus was prone to fits of anger. In fact, you remember in the 300 Spartans, uh, they uh, had to uh, come across the Hellespont. That's that little narrow uh, stretch of land that leads from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. And so the way to do that was uh, they would build a, a bridges, pontoon bridges across there in order for the army to get across. So uh, let me just uh, read from you. This is uh, from Herodotus, the uh, famous Greek historian. He says this. In order for his massive army to march from Turkey, where they were assembled, into Greece, Ahasuerus ordered that bridges be built across the Hellespont. That's the narrow piece of water between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. They needed to get through there to get to Greece. And the bridges were, however, destroyed in a storm before the troops were able to use them. Ahasuerus was furious. Hmm. The storm had destroyed the bridges they had built. He thought that they had been inadequately built by the engineers. So, would you have liked to have been one of his engineers? No. So he gathered the engineers together and chopped their heads off. He then, furious with the water, sent the soldiers into the water with whips demanding that they lash the ocean 300 times for its insubordination. <laughs> then he sent the soldiers to throw shackles into the water to bind the water and to stab the waves with red hot irons. Now there's a temper tantrum for you. 
Well, it may have because they rebuilt the bridges and this time they lasted long enough for them to get across. But this is the kind of man we're dealing with here. Now when you read that, you think, well, that makes them look kind of silly, doesn't it? We look the same way when we do stuff out of anger. We look foolish, we look silly. In James chapter 1, verse 20, there's a good piece of wisdom there, and it says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. See? The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And if you think about the times you've been angry and what that produced, it probably wasn't the righteousness of God. Ahasuerus was a powerful man, but he was not a very wise man. He was unwise in letting his temper run rampant, but he was also unwise in picking his advisors. Remember we touched on that a little bit last time. He surrounded himself with a bunch of yes men because a weak leader doesn't want people around him that will challenge him. He wants people around him that will agree with him. And so he does. And in this habit of surrounding himself with weak advisors, he elevates Haman. Compare, and I was, I was kind of struck at some of the comparisons because I'd never thought of, about it before too much, but compare Ahasuerus, go back way back now uh, to, to Exodus, and compare Ahasuerus to the Pharaoh. Now, we, we often, we, we're familiar with, with the Pharaoh's stubbornness and his hardness of heart and how he wouldn't let the people go. But I want to go back before that. When Pharaoh was going to make somebody second in command, now in Exodus, Pharaoh's the most powerful man in the world. Who did he choose? He chose Joseph because Joseph was wise enough to interpret his dreams and he said I want a wise man as my advisor and I ran into another interesting thing and you can research this because I could be wrong but there are only two times I know of in scripture where it tells us about a king taking off his signet ring and giving it to his advisor and Pharaoh takes his ring off and gives it to Joseph that was a wise move on Pharaoh's part. Ahasuerus takes his ring off and gives it to Haman. Not a wise move on his part. So it's interesting to me the comparisons there. He lacked wisdom, therefore Haman is going to be able to manipulate him. See? Because those kinds of leaders are easily manipulated. He cared nothing about his people. What is the king's main job? It's to, if he's a wise king, it's to take care of his people. But a Ahasuerus could care less about his people. Let's read here verses 8 through 13. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Now he's referring to the Jews, but the Jews are his people too. They're under his rulership. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. Well, wouldn't a wise king say, well, wait a minute. We're going to commit genocide here. Uh, I, I think we need a little more to go on than that. Uh, explain to me why you think this needs to be done. But Ahasuerus doesn't care about his people. Doesn't care if they live or die. When he weighed the potential financial benefits and the praise of Haman against the cost of signing off on the destruction of all these people. He went with the money 
and the accolades rather than with the good of his people. When it comes to character, this very powerful man is also a very weak man. Now, nah, that's probably enough of a hazardous. I think we've got the, got the idea of who he is. But you know, one more thing. Oftentimes, we look at powerful people, whether they be kings or whether they be uh, uh, successful business people, athletes, whatever they are, and we say, look what a great person so-and-so is. And maybe they are. But maybe they're as vacuous when it comes to character as a Ahasuerus is. Because fame and fortune and earthly power don't necessarily mean we have character or Christ in our hearts. Well, let's take a look at Haman. Haman is the guy that you love to hate. And rightly so. Uh, we find really nothing good in Haman. But, let, but who exactly is he? He just showed up. Where did he come from? Well, the Bible actually tells us a lot about Haman. It tells us, for one thing, that he was an Agagite. Now, anybody that's an Agagite can't be a good guy. <laughs> and he's not. And neither were they, as we're going to see here in a minute. It's interesting that the Bible tells us five times, right here in the book of Esther, that Mordecai was an Agagite. Well, why is it important that we know that? And, and four of those five times, it even tells us who his father was, so we, we can trace his lineage and know where he came from. Why such specificity about this guy? Well, it's going to explain a little bit about why he and Mordecai were at such loggerheads with each other. Let's travel all the way back again to Exodus. We're going back uh, roughly a thousand years in the book of Exodus. And the, the people have come out, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're, they're out into the desert, and the first group that they encounter that comes out to battle with them are none other than, not the Agagites, the Amalekites. Okay? Now, just to get you ahead a little bit so you're not confused, Agag is an Amalekite king who we'll talk about in a minute, and his descendants are the Agagites, one of whom is Haman. Okay? So the Amalekites come out to battle with God's people. They fight the battle. They win the battle. And God says this in Exodus 17, verse 14, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Pretty straightforward. Well, if he's going to do that, how do we end up with one of them in the book of Esther? Well, let's see what happens. In our men's group, we're going through a book called How God Makes Men. And both the men's groups are doing it together. And one of the, I think it was the first chapter, but at one point, the author introduces this concept to us he calls Bible time. And he talks about how when we read the Bible, we need to learn to think in Bible time. And in other words, God says, I'm going to do something, and we say, okay, he's going to do it today. Well, God's not constricted by a timeline like we are. He has forever. In fact, I tell people the problem with working with God is he acts like he has forever to get things done. <laughs> and we don't. We've got our own timeline out there. So if he says he's going to wipe out the Amalekites, how come there were still Amalekites? Well, we'll find out why there were still Amalekites. 400 years goes by from the time of the Exodus. And we find that we have a, a king now, and his name is Saul. And what we're going to find out is the reason we still had Haman around to cause trouble is because Saul was disobedient to God. In, a, in a, what could be called a small way, 
But disobedience to God always causes problems. And it may not cause them today, but down the line, it's going to cause problems. So if you were to read 1 Samuel chapter 15, you'll find that Saul is leading the Israelites in a conquest, and he's, he's doing great. He's winning all these battles and all sorts of things. And now he comes up against none other than the Amalekites, who now at this time are led by King Agag. Right? And you probably have heard that story too because this is where uh, uh, he's out there and they're, they're losing and need people to help hold up Moses' arms and so on and so forth. And, or that was in the first one. I'm sorry, I messed that up. Terrible. <laughs> that was in the Exodus when the Amalekites came out and they had to hold up Moses' arms and stuff. This is 400 years later. Anyway, Saul is told to go and conquer King Agag and not to take any spoils, to destroy everything, to kill everybody. And I know that sounds bad to us, but that was the instructions he received. So Saul goes and Saul wins the battle. Okay. But now Saul, and we're all in one way or another a little related to him it seems, Saul in his mind thinks this thing over and he says, well, God told me to destroy everything but I'm going to kill all the animals except the best ones. And I'll keep the best ones. And I'm going to, I killed already a lot of the people, so I'm going to let the king live. Well, how's that going to work out for him? Not very well. Because there's a prophet by the name of Samuel, right? We're in 1 Samuel. And Samuel is coming to the battlefield. And as the story goes, he hears the bleeding of cattle and the uh, or bleeding of sheep and the lowing of cattle, and uh, he hears that the, the king has been spared. And so he comes over the hill, so to speak, and he says to Saul, "Hey, I thought you were told to uh, not take any spoils. I thought you were told to kill everybody." And Saul said to Samuel, "I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Really." I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil. Now, isn't that a good leader? You ever see? He didn't say I took of the spoil. The people took of the spoils. You, you ever work for a guy like that, or follow a, a leader like that when it, when something's gone wrong? Well, it wasn't me. It was the people did that. Well, that's exactly what Saul's doing here. He says, but the people took the spoils, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction. Now watch this. To sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So in other words, Samuel, I didn't take these things because I wanted them. I, I took them so I could give them to God. So I disobeyed God in order to honor God. That's what he's saying. Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying, obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. And of course, that's a saying we're all familiar with. That still doesn't quite explain, though, this great enmity between Mordecai and Haman. Well, what happens next, if you read chapter 15, is another one of those places that kind of makes you cringe a little bit. Mordecai, or not Mordecai, geez, Daryl, Samuel, picks up an axe, and as the scripture says, hacks Agag to death. Not a very pretty picture. Haman is a direct descendant of Agag. So, this Jew, Samuel, killed his ancestor. And so we have this great enmity. And to make matters worse, Mordecai is a descendant of Saul, who conquered him in the first place. So there's all this hatred for the Jews from Haman. So that's kind of how we set this up. But what I want you to take away from Samuel, if we can just do a little aside, and the story about Saul, that partial disobedience or partial obedience is disobedience. 
See? If God tells you to go over here and you almost go there, you might as well not go at all because it's still disobedience. And so, because Saul failed to wipe them out, we have Haman causing problems 400 years later. Saul loses his kingdom. Samuel kills Agag, but the roots of hatred are planted. We know this about Haman. He was a prideful man. We look here in verse 5 and 6. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Now why would a guy like Haman, here he is, second in command of the kingdom, so he's the second most powerful man in the world, why would he pay any attention to some mid-level bureaucrat that refuses to bow down to him? Because his pride can't stand it. And you've known people like that too, haven't you? You know, you just, they just can't stand for anybody to not do exactly what they think they ought to do. And so Haman says to himself, well, this guy's a Jew. I hate the Jews. I think I can use this incident to get rid of all the Jews. So Haman, while he's despicable, he's not stupid. He's intelligent. And he sees his chance. And he seizes his opportunity. And so he goes to Ahasuerus. It's too bad that Haman couldn't have talked to James, who wrote the book of James in chapter 4, verse 6. It said that God opposes the proud, but assists the humble. So Haman thinks he's got it going all his way, but he doesn't know that God is going to oppose him. And it's the same in our lives again. When we get all full of ourselves, God says, okay, go ahead. You take over. And it's every time we fall on our face. Haman is going to use his position of power and influence to serve himself and destroy those he doesn't like. You think back now to Exodus again and Joseph and Pharaoh there. Joseph used his power and influence to save the lives of not only his people but of the Egyptians also. What a difference in people. Two men given virtually the same positions virtually the same opportunities, one uses his power and influence to save the people, the other is going to try to use his power and influence to destroy the people. So that's Haman. How'd you like to have him for a next door neighbor? Well, what about Mordecai? Let's take a look at him. It comes up here in verse 2. And the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Well, up until now, if we were going to give Mordecai an English name, you know, we often run into in Scripture where they'll have a Hebrew name and a Greek name. Well, if we were going to give him an English name, uh, the name that popped into my head immediately was Neville Chamberlain. If you remember anything about Neville Chamberlain, he became, he, he's the guy that flew to Germany. World War II was uh, about to take place. And he flew to Germany, and he had a meeting with Hitler, and he came home, and he gave this speech, and the famous quote from his speech is, we have achieved peace in our time. And then World War II happened. And I, I believe it was Churchill that said, you, you went and you agreed on peace, and now you will have war. And that's exactly, that's kind of the, what, what Mordecai was doing. He was just 
living his life, making whatever compromises that needed to be made, accommodating uh, the world around him in whatever ways needed to be so that he could get along and go along. Now before we judge him too harshly, we all do that. We all make accommodations. Uh, we all uh, keep quiet sometimes when we ought to speak up. Uh, it's, it's just the way we are. You know? Mordecai certainly had no problem bowing down to the king. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been in his position. There's no way he would have been in that, in that position. So why wouldn't he bow down to Haman? Because Haman's an Agagite and he hates the Agagites. And as I said, we all struggle to some extent with this. How much accommodation are we going to make? Where do we draw the line? Uh, Paul, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he, he lays it out there, even he made accommodation. You know, he says, to the Jews I become as a Jew, to, to the Greeks I become as a Greek, etc., etc., so that by all means I might win some. Uh, again, Paul with Timothy and Titus. If you're familiar with those stories, when he was going to take Timothy into ministry with him, he insisted that he be circumcised. When he was going to take Titus, no need. Don't worry about it. Why? The situations were different. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. The whole thing was about how much can we make accommodation to the Gentiles and still call ourselves Jewish Christians. It's a question we all have to answer. And here's the thing about that question. It's different for different people. Okay. The things you don't compromise on, though, are who Jesus Christ is. Is the Bible the Word of God? Those issues are settled. You can make no compromise on those and still call yourself a Christian. On social issues and that, we can disagree all day long and still be God's people. But Mordecai will discover something that seems to hold true, and I don't like it. And that is that commitment always comes with a cost. Commitment always comes with a cost. Christians throughout the centuries who have stood for their faith have suffered greatly. Many lose not only their possessions, but their lives. And we're seeing that right now. By the grace of God, it's not happening here. Yet. And so Mordecai now has taken this stand. And because he has taken a stand, this decree has gone out now that we are going to kill all of the Jews. Uh, see, I'll just pick it up in verse 14. A copy of this document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown, thrown in confusion. And if you read the whole chapter there, you'll find out that the, tr the decree is that on a certain day all of the peoples of Persia will be allowed to go out and kill all of the Jews. So again, we have this juxtaposition of the powerful against the powerless, because you remember the Jews got there as uh, slaves taken in war, and so they have no weapons, they have no right to own weapons, they have no power for anything, and that's why uh, they're going to be certainly be killed. How do you suppose Mordecai feels now? Because of his stubborn refusal to bow down to Haman, not only him, but all of his people are going to be killed. I think if we could talk to, Haman, or to Mordecai, he might feel a little bit like the inscription that uh, in Dante's Inferno that he has over the entrance to hell, where it says, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. I think that's just how Mordecai felt. Because the laws of the Medes and the Persians, once given, could not be changed even by the king. They were unchangeable laws. There's no way out. And that's where our story ends. However, things are not always as they seem. 
Mordecai might say, well, where in the world is God? We're all going to die. You know, we expect to suffer when we sin, don't we? We expect to have something go wrong when we willfully sin. Now, I know you guys never willfully sin, but I do sometimes. And, and when we suffer from that, we're not surprised because we got it coming. But Mordecai did a good thing because I say he stubbornly refused to bow down to Haman. Some of that stubbornness came because he was a Jew. He was God's, one of God's people. And what he did was a good thing and it was a right thing and it was a courageous thing. After years of living a life of compromise and accommodation, he finally takes a stand for God. And look what happens. The worst. Not only is he going to suffer the loss of his life, but he's responsible for the loss of all his people's lives. How do you think he feels? Wow. The Jews had no means to defend themselves. Their fate was sealed. No one in power cared about them at all. Not only did the leaders not care about the Jews, but they did not care about the hardships of dis that destroying them would cause their own people. Notice the last words in this chapter. The city was thrown into confusion. Why? Because the positions the Jews filled were mostly those of servants and so on and so forth. They did all the jobs the Persians didn't want to do. So now all the Persians are going to be running around trying to figure out how we're going to replace these people. But the king doesn't care. So as we leave our players this week, remember there's more to come. But we leave them in a very dark place. But what I want you to do is compare the king of Persia to the king of love, Jesus. One totally uncaring about those who serve him. I don't care, kill them all. Doesn't matter to me. The other, Jesus, loves us so much, he came and died for us. Well, you can't get more poles apart than that, can you? He left all the glories of heaven to come and give his life for us. The only man to live a perfect life and what was his reward? He got crucified. And Peter talks about it a little bit. And, and he says, you know, that we shouldn't be surprised when we suffer for doing good. Because we live in a world that is fallen and sinful. And if even Jesus Christ suffered for doing good, why would we think we are going to be above that? He told us, in this world we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. And whatever we suffer here is just a, a speck in time. The kings of this world ask that we give our lives for them. Our king gave his life for us. And the question for you is, which king are you serving? Because there's only two groups. It always comes down to that. Two groups. God's people and not God's people. You're either serving a king who will kill you or a king who will save you. And it's up to you. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for this uh, little book of Esther and the things we're learning and seeing as we go through it. And Lord, to thank you that you're a king who loves and cares for us who left your heaven, your throne room, and you came to this earth to suffer and die that we might have eternal life. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their, their King, their Savior, their Lord, I would pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them and right now in the quietness of their heart, they would say, Jesus, I want you to be my King. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And that they would know that instantly, they are bestowed with eternal life, a gift that can never be taken away. And now, Lord, encourage us this week to perhaps 
share you with others, invite others to this place. We ask it all in your name, Jesus. Amen.